Welcome to the Northern Chapter of the Arizona Falls Prevention Coalition's virtual event, Stop Falls This Fall. This year we're very excited to bring to you experts in the field of personal safety with respect to fall prevention. We'd like to introduce you to Kim Tate. She's the Activity Specialist with NACOG Area Agency on Aging, and she will be your host for this event. Take it away, Kim. Thank you, Beth and Rachel. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Thurman Lockhart, PhD, Professor School of Biological and Health System Engineering at Arizona State University. He is a recipient of the Alexander C. William Jr. Design Award from Human Factors and Ergonomic Safety. His work is featured in PBS Nova, Good Morning America, amongst many others. He is a creator of Lockhart Monitor app for phones. Dr. Lockhart and his students are going to give you a fascinating tour of the Locomotion Lab at Arizona State University, where they conduct research into fall prevention. Right here in Arizona, the Locomotion Research Lab is home to state-of-the-art equipment for fall risk assessment in individuals. Beth Frio met with Dr. Lockhart, a professor of biomedical engineering at Arizona State University, and his graduate students for a tour. Our first stop is the virtual reality system, which at first glance looks like a giant video game. Some of the features include a motion sensor treadmill and a computer monitor system. And so this is what we do, you know, gait analysis, walking analysis, to see how stable you are and how reactive you are to a certain extent. And then we're able to measure that kinematically and use the model of that, okay? And this is the uh, virtual reality uh, kind of a form that you see here. And these are the actual measurements uh, that that's gonna happen associated with William. And those are the, our gate parameters or biomechanical parameters as we call them, okay? And so this is not a just a regular, uh, you know, treadmill. It has double, you know, part of it, split double treadmill. It's got a force plate on it. But you need this kind of uh, measurement system to really understand what's happening inside of us. We can't really measure like joint torque, like, you know, with x-rays and things. Only way to measure the torquing and the straining and the compressive force and the shear force of the bones we have to model it, and we are using this system to do that. So let's go ahead and do this. So the treadmill is going, and you can see the model there. And that's, you know, uh, pick up your right leg. So you can see that it's moving like that. That's fine. Uh, walk normal. And as he walks normal, and this the gray bar is the kind of normal per his age More importantly, if you are unstable, we will be able to see what type of you know, the problem that you have in terms of uh, uh, instability. The way to do that is through the perturbation mechanism. So this doesn't just walk. Uh, go ahead. That's what we call lateral perturbation. That happens sometimes, you know. Walking on you know, surfaces. So this is gain analysis, perturbation platform. This is how we assess the mechanistic uh, mechanism, biomechanic mechanism associated with fall accidents. Using this information, we use a variety of sensors like the Lockhart monitor that we're going to be showing you to create assessment that are very similar to this, so as that that app does almost the same as what this million dollar system is doing. That is the essence of what we're trying to do here. Okay? And of course, at the same time, you know, assess their instability or stability and reduce fall accidents at the end of the day. You'll notice that Beth is harnessed to prevent actual falling as a result of the perturbation, which is defined as creating a disturbance in movement to simulate falling. The system analyzes a variety of data points. One particular area of research is helping improve coordination for individuals with Parkinson's. If you put a, for example,
example, Parkinson's patient, a 78 year old female Parkinson's individual that has been suffering for you know, 10 or 20 years of Parkinson's disease. They would behave very similarly. Uh, initially, they were fall, they were walk, and it appears they can get actually used to it and uh, used to the perturbation so that they don't fall. And, uh, and at the end of the day, basically, when we measure their balance, their balance is much more closer to younger individuals' type of a control system, where that control system is before, you see that control system being kind of like static. Whereas after going through the perturbation, your control system now is uh, more, uh, uh, you know, is searching for, you know, to a certain extent, the best opportunity, such that, that given a perturbation, you could react much more, more for, uh, much faster. Continuing on the tour, Dr. Lockhart demonstrates the Lockhart Monitor app, which can be used by anyone and is free on your Apple device. They are working on making the app available for Android phones. The Lockhart Monitor app measures your walking speed, stability, and other variables of fall prevention. And this thing comes up. And let's demonstrate the walking. Back, walk over here a little bit. And I want you to start from here. And I want you to just go ahead and end it about right here, okay? okay one second. So what, what's gonna happen is there's gonna be a beat, and then she's gonna rest. That's getting the baseline data. And then a second beat, she will walk all the way over here and pass this and stop completely. Then walk. And when you cross the line, completely stop and it stops automatically and here is the results and uh, we can look at the results uh, i don't know if they you could see that can you see it mm -hmm. yeah so her velocity was 0.89 uh 1.98 miles per hour uh distance and duration and these kind of things okay so that's the gate speed and uh, if the gate speed is in a green you're doing very well, okay? So here it is. Red, no good. Am I green? Uh, you're in green, you're green. Thank you, Dr. Lockhart, and that fascinating tour. Now we'll hear from Melissa Luxton. Melissa has a Master's of Science in Nursing and is the Trauma Outreach Injury Prevention Coordinator at Banner Health. She's the chair of the Arizona Falls Prevention Coalition, and she will share with us how we can reduce falls in our surroundings. Take it away, Melissa. Hello, my name is Melissa Lepston, MSNRN. I work for Banner Health with Banner University Medical Center, Phoenix. So what I'm here today to talk to you is about falls and the risk of falling and a couple different strategies on how you can prevent your risk of falling and staying independent longer. So what I want to start out with is just a couple of facts about falls that you may or may not know. So according to the data in 2018, one in four older adults reported falling. That equals over 36 million falls. And more than 8 million of those people who fell required medical attention. In fact, more than 32,000 older adults died from a fall, which equals 88 older, older adults dying each day in one every 20 minutes. In one year alone, the cost for falls is over $50 billion. And 95% of hip fractures in our older adult population is caused by falls. It's no secret that all adults age 65 and older are at an increased risk for falling. Contrary to popular belief, falls are not a normal part of aging and they can be prevented. Okay, so one out of five results in serious injury and we can prevent those falls, keeping you active and keeping you independent for longer. So how do we do that? I'm going to cover a few sim simple things that you can do to keep yourself from falling and staying independent longer. 
One thing that people do is when they fall down, they tend not to tell anybody out of embarrassment or they're ashamed or fear of um, their lifestyle changing. So open communication with your primary care provider or any of your providers that provide specialties to you is a great way to prevent your risk of falling. So talk to those providers. Let them know if you've fallen recently or if you just feel unsteady. Okay, um, going over your medications, doing a medication review with your um, provider it will drastically reduce your risk of falling. They can take a look at all the medications you're on. They can identify which ones increase your risk, risk, make you aware. You can know those side effects, know for things to look out for. And maybe there's even some medications that can be removed from your regimen that you don't really need that are increasing that risk. There's all different kinds of medications out there that do increase that risk, so I'm going to cover just a couple of them really quick. Um, we want to be on the lookout for any anti-seizure medications, any antidepressants, any um, antipsychotics, our benzodiazepines, so like um, Xanax or Ativan, those can really increase your risk for falling. Same thing with our opioids, so any painkillers, we just want to be really aware that those can make us dizzy and increase that risk of falling down. Or sedatives or hypnotics, so sleeping medications. If you're on something like Ativan or Restoril, you wanna be aware that that can increase your risk. Um, simple over-the-counter medications like antihistamines or Benadryls, they actually dry us out. Um, they can lower our blood pressure or cause us to become dehydrated. And that can increase your risk for falling by getting dizzy. Um, muscle relaxers are another one. And then common medications that a lot of our older adults are on that we want to be really careful with um, and just know and watch for those signs and symptoms are blood pressure medications. A lot of our older adults are on blood pressure medications usually to drop the blood pressure because their blood pressure is too high. So what happens if that blood pressure medication works just a little bit too good? You could drop your blood pressure too low, and so when you go from sitting to standing, you might get dizzy, and that could increase your risk for falling. So those of you that are on blood pressure medications, listen to your body. Take it slow. It's not a race. Get up slowly. Make sure you're not feeling that dizziness, and then go ahead and walk once you feel steady and stable on your feet. If you are feeling dizzy, slow down sit back down and don't get up and move until you feel like you can be steady. Same thing with our heart medications. Um, many people over the age of 65 are on heart medications to reduce their heart rate because it's going too fast. Um, things like atrial fibrillation. Again, just like our blood pressure medications, those heart medications can work a little bit too good. And what happens if they drop the heart rate too low? Again, we get dizzy. So just listening to your body, taking your time, don't rush it, okay? Really reduce your risk of falling. Blood thinners, we wanna talk about blood thinners. These are really, really important. If you're on any blood thinning medication and you fall, it is important to seek that medical attention, especially if you've fallen and hit in your head. Um, many of our older adults that fall, they hit their head, they're on blood thinners, they don't seek medical attention, they feel fine right away, and then over the course of a few hours or even a few days, they become more confused, and it turns out that they had a head bleed. So seeking medical attention if you do hit your head if you're on blood thinners is really, really important. Um, if that bleed becomes too bad, bad and you wait too long, the treatment plans become less and less effective. So we want to get that immediate attention to you and get you back to being independent, okay? Um, a couple of, uh, another thing that you can do with your doctor is ask about health conditions that increase your risk. So if, you're, if you have depression or if you have osteoarthritis, that can increase your risk for falling, especially our arthritis patients or those with osteoarthritis. Those bones, as we age, they're not getting stronger, right? They're getting weaker as we age, and so that increases our risk for falling. Getting your regular eye exams is important. Make sure that you're seeing properly will definitely help you in keeping yourself safe. Staying active is really important. We all love exercise, especially as we get older, exercise becomes more enticing. 
Just kidding. It doesn't. A lot of us hate exercise, but it's so important to keeping us strong. And when I say exercise, I don't mean that you have to go hit the gym and work out for an hour, two hours every day. It's just a couple days a week, even three days a week of just simple exercises. You can do right in your own home. We'll keep those muscles strong, keep you from falling down, keeping you active, keeping you loose. Um, one of my favorite exercises that I like to teach is drawing the alphabet with your ankles. So all you have to do is while you're sitting down, just draw the ABCs. And that keeps those ankle muscles moving around and those bones nice and strong. You can do things like just arm rotations, keeping those shoulders moving and going back. You can do things just like neck rotations, which these are also great for driving because we have to turn our heads and as we age, those um, tend, tend to get tenser and weaker. So keeping those neck muscles moving around. Very simple things. Um, one of my favorite tools for our older adult population is little resistance and stretchy bands. You can find these often at places like the dollar store or online outlets like Amazon. They're relatively cheap and they're just resistance training. So you're using your own weight and it does things for your arms. You can use them in different ways for your legs. And it's just using the weight of your own body. So these are great tools to keeping those muscles strong and our bones healthy. A big thing in staying safe is our home safety. So making sure our homes are safe environments, okay? Most of our falls that happen, happen in the bathroom. The bathroom tends to be the number one hot spot for falling down. And it's usually in the middle of the night. This sets us up for a recipe for disaster. As we age, we end up on more medications for different reasons. Our bladders aren't as strong as they used to be. And so we might wake up in the middle of the night with that sense of urgency. And so we go from laying to standing and then that blood pressure drops because we went from down here to up here rather quickly. And then we hurry and run to the bathroom and then boom, we fall down. Our bathroom is hard surfaced. There's all kinds of hard things in the bathroom to hit our heads on to break bones. The floor can be slippery, there's water in there. It's just a terrible situation. So how do we avoid it? All right, good lighting, number one. So maybe a bedside lamp. Turn that lamp on or night lights that will light your path. Make sure you have really good lighting. Take your time. When you go from that sleeping to sitting up, give yourself 10, 15, 20 seconds to adjust, then go to standing. Make sure you don't feel dizzy. Make sure you feel okay. Then walk to the bathroom with your lit hat. Make sure you've got lighting in the bathroom so you can see everything, okay? So it's a really good way to prevent those falls from happening in the middle of the night in the bathroom. Another time we fall in the bathroom is coming out of the shower. So we've got water everywhere. We tell you guys don't have rugs. Well, shower mats are okay, okay? Shower mats are okay, but we wanna make sure that we always pick that shower mat up so it doesn't become a problem after the shower. So as we shower, we can have things like non-slip um, grips in our shower to help us from falling. Um, one thing that I love that I think is great is um, grab bars. So any grab bar will do um, as long as it can be hard mounted into the wall. There's a lot of tools out there that have suction cups and things like that that just aren't that strong and they end up actually becoming a problem for our older adults because they're relying on them and they break loose from either the shower door or the wall. So really refrain from getting anything that's like a tension rod or a suction cup. We want something that can be hard mounted in to the studs of the wall with screws. Um, you may have to have somebody professionally install that for you or if you have a family member or a friend that knows how to get these guys in there the right way, they can be great tools. We can put these in the shower, around the shower, next to the toilet, all over the bathroom and they're great tools to keep us from falling. Again, making sure you're picking up that shower mat every time. So as soon as you dry off and that water drips to the floor, pick up the shower mat, hang it either inside the shower with the water dripping down. Some people have a towel bar that works really well that they can hang that on or hang it over the tub to where it's draining into the shower and make sure you wipe up all the water on the floor that may have gotten um, off the mat after you've showered. 
Okay, so we don't have that slippery floor in there. Again, lighting is so, so, so important. There's all different kinds of lighting. I love night lights. I think night lights are great. And for those of you that love to save energy, you can do things like a censored night light. So it's got a little sensor on it. As soon as it senses your shadow and you're moving around, it's gonna light up and light your path. So you're not having that energy on for those of you that are energy conscious. Um, there's other cool night lights out there. This is one of my favorite ones for adults over 65. It has a power failure night light, so it runs all the time on a backup battery. And it is also activated by a smoke alarm. So if your smoke alarm goes off, this little night light will sense it and it will automatically light your path, which is great in the instance of a fire. So these are great night lights that you can have. It's all kinds of different ones on the market and they all do the job great. Um, but again, bedside lamps, making sure you have that path lit well. Speaking of rugs, we talked about the shower mat. Let's talk about throw rugs in the home. So throw rugs can become a big problem for our older adults, and we recommend that we have all throw rugs up off the floor. If you can see my rug down here, it's bund up, bunched up, and it can be a major tripping hazard. And unfortunately, these throw rugs end up like that all the time, and people trip and fall on them. So get rid of the throw rugs. Um, I've had people that have told me, I can't get rid of it. I love it so much. Somebody special made it for me. I can't take it away. It's, it's my favorite rug. Turn it into a tapestry, hang it on the wall, use it as a decorative piece. You don't have to get rid of it if it has sentimental meaning, meaning. Just repurpose it and get it up off the ground, okay? Another thing that I always like to talk about is our shoes, okay? Shoes become a major hazard. Um, people trip over shoes, so we always recommend having a door organize, a shoe organizer by your door or a specified closet to keep your shoes in and that clutter off the floor to reduce tripping over them. On the topic of clutter, we want to make sure we don't have our clutter, okay? So old newspapers, magazines, extension cords, anything that we can trip over, we want to make sure that that's put away in the safe place and it's not out in the open because all that clutter adds to additional tripping hazards. So make sure we move that out of the way. Extension cords can be a huge tripping hazard. So if you do need an extension cord, make sure that it's not strung across the floor. We would like those extension cords tucked up against the wall. So if you do have to use one, make sure it's nice and snug against the wall and not out in the middle of your area to where anybody's going to trip over it. Another thing that many of our older adults trip over is their oxygen tubing. If you wear oxygen tubing, especially at home, um, any of you that are on it long term, you probably have that lovely 100 foot cord that all of us in healthcare absolutely love. People trip over them all the time and they end up in the hospital to see us. So be very careful with those long extended oxygen cords that you're using through your homes. We recommend always putting some colored tape on it so that you can see it easily. Okay, these oxygen tubings are usually typically clear. They blend in with their surroundings. People can't see them and then they trip over them. So just taking a colored piece of tape or duct tape, anything, and putting them every couple inches will draw your eye to it and keep you from tripping over it. Another thing that we trip over a lot of times is our pets, our four-legged friends. They love us so much and they wanna be by us. And if you have any cats or dogs and they're anything like my animals, they're always under your feet all the time. And it's great that they wanna be near us, but they pose a big tripping hazard. So what we recommend is putting a little bell on their collar. You put a little bell on your pet's collar and then it alerts you that they're nearby so you can hear them, watch out for them, and then that way you're not tripping over them and falling and hurting yourself. If you have stairs in your home and you have animals, it's a great idea to put a baby gate in, especially if you have grandkids as well. It keeps grandkids off the steps, but if you don't have grandchildren, just pets, that keeps those pets off the steps. We have lots of older adults that fall down the stairs because their pets get up and underneath their legs fall on those stairs. So baby gate's a great idea to keep those unwanted things off of those staircases. Just a reminder, if you're ever using stairs, our handrails are meant to use on both sides. So we always wanna be using both sides of our handrails to be going up and down our stairs that equals support. And then make sure your stairs are free of clutter. We don't want clutter on the stairs that increases our tripping hazards and risk of falling down those stairs. Another thing I wanna to talk to you guys about is assistive devices. So as we age and we may need those assistive devices, a lot of us shy away from using them 
when we need them. And it's really important that if you're not steady, that you talk with your provider about assistive devices, blockers, canes, all those things are great tools to helping you stay independent and keeping you active, okay? That's what we wanna do. Our whole goal is keeping you independent and active. Um, canes, there's a lot of misconceptions on how to use them, how to pick the right one, which one's the best one. So with canes, the best cane is whichever one works the best for you. We're all different. We all have different ways that we like to hold things, or maybe if you have arthritis, it may hurt you to hold a grip a certain way. Maybe, you know, so you just have to try them out. Um, with our canes, we wanna always make sure they're at the right height. So measuring that cane to make sure it's the appropriate height for you. What you're gonna do is hang your arm down with your elbow straight. And then the crease of that wrist should be level with the top of the cane. And your elbow should be bent at about 20 to 30 degree angle. When you're using that cane, you're going to hold it on the unaffected side. So if my right leg is weak, I want to hold my cane in my left hand. It's opposite of the affected leg, okay? You're going to move the cane forward with the affected leg. So again, if my right leg is the weak one, I'm holding it in my left hand. As I walk, I'm going to advance the cane and my affected leg at the same time. Some tips for um, staying safe with your cane is place the cane nearby you, okay? It doesn't need to be way out in front of you. We wanna keep it close by. Take small steps. Don't try to overstep, okay? That increase our risk of falling. So take those small steps and take your time, okay? This will avoid overstepping and tripping. Our footwear is also an important part of fall prevention. So making sure that you choose the right footwear. And every again, this is an individualized thing. Everybody's different. And so what's right for somebody may not be right for you. But as a general rule of thumb, we're looking for nice, supportive shoes. So shoes with laces are nice and supportive. They go around our foot. We don't risk those from falling off versus something like a sandal or a flip-flop, um, backless shoes where those shoes can easily fall off. Um, we also want you to have something that's got good grip, so good traction. Um, a lot of those uh, sneakers out there, just check the treads on them, make sure they've got that good traction. When we have um, people in flip-flops, they tend to lose their shoe, they fall off, they're slippery, they get on water, and then they go down. So always choose that nice supportive shoe that you feel the best in, that you feel steady in. Thank you, Melissa Lexton. Now we're going to hear from Captain Dave Haskell. He is the Paramedic Emergency Services Coordinator at the Prescott Fire Department. Captain Dave? Hello, I'm Dave Haskell with the Prescott Fire Department. Today we're going to be discussing the National Fire Protection Association's Remembering When Fire and Fall Prevention Program for Older Adults. Uh, basic goal here today uh, is to help older adults live safely in their home for as long as possible. So two components of today's presentation. Uh, I know the emphasis of this presentation is on falls. However, this wouldn't be a true firefighter presentation if I didn't include a few fire safety messages. So we're going to do eight fire prevention messages, and then we're going to do the eight fall prevention messages. So here are the eight fire prevention messages. Fire message one, if you smoke, smoke outside. Smoking is a leading cause of older adult home fire deaths. About half of all fatal home victims are 65 or older. Almost 10% of smokers whose smoking started reporting home fires were using oxygen. Uh, use deep, sturdy ashtrays, wet cigarette butts and ashes before throwing them out. Never smoke in bed. Never smoke if medical oxygen is used anywhere in the home. Fire message number two. Give space heaters space. Keep heaters at least three feet away from anything that can burn, including yourself. Shut off and unplug heaters when you leave the room or go to bed. Fire message number three. Never leave any cooked food unattended. Wear short or form-fitting sleeves. If a pan or food catches on fire, slide a lid over it and turn off the burner. 
Don't cook when drowsy from alcohol or medications. If you do happen to get burned, a first degree burn is a burn without blisters. You're able to cool that with water for three to five minutes. Fire message number four. You've all heard this one before, stop, drop, and roll. If your clothes catch on fire, stop, drop, gently to the ground and cover your face with your hands. Roll over and over or back and forth to put out the fire. Call 911 right away. Especially for blistered burns, burns covering more than 10% of the body, uh, burns to the face, or burns uh, encircling the hands or the feet. If you use a wh wheelchair, scooter, or other device and are able to get to the floor, lock the device first before getting out and then roll until the flames are out. If you cannot drop and roll, keep a blanket or towel nearby to smother the flames. If you are a bystander, consider grabbing a rug, blanket, or fire blanket to help extinguish the flames. Smoke alarms save lives. This is fire message number five. Have smoke alarms on every level of your home, in each bedroom, and outside each sleeping area. Interconnected alarms are always the best. Um, when one sounds, they all sound together. Make sure everyone can hear the smoke alarms. Have someone test your smoke alarms once a month and replace all alarms that are 10 years or older. Install carbon monoxide alarms outside each sleeping area and on every level of your home. If you do not feel comfortable installing batteries in your smoke detectors or carbon monoxide alarms, please reach out to your local fire department for assistance. Fire message number six, plan and practice your escape from fire. If possible, have two ways out of every room and two ways out of the home. Make sure windows and doors open easily. If an alarm sounds, get outside to your prearranged meeting place and stay there. Every second counts. Fire message number seven, know your local emergency number. In Arizona, it's 911. Escape the fire and then call the fire department from a neighbor's phone or a mobile phone. Fire message number eight, plan your escape around your abilities. Have a telephone in your bedroom in case you are trapped by smoke or fire. Have other necessary items near your bed, such as short-term supply or list of medications, glasses, walker, scooter, or a cane. And now for the fall prevention messages. Before we learn the eight fall prevention messages, we're going to look at some disturbing statistics. Falls are the most common cause of non-fatal injuries and hospital admissions for trauma. In 2010, 2.3 million older adults were treated in emergency departments. More than 662,000 of these patients were hospitalized. Falls usually are not true accidents. They can be prevented. Falls can create a vicious cycle. A fall often increases an adult's fear of falling, even if they are not injured. This fear can lead to a decrease in activity. This leads to a reduced mobility and fitness, which in turn increases the risk of falling again. Fall message number one, exercise regularly. Exercise, such as walking, builds strength and improves coordination and balance. Talk with your doctor about the best physical exercise for you. Group exercise can also help maintain your social health. Fall message number two, take your time. Get out of chairs slowly. Sit for a moment before you stand up to get out of your bed. Stand and get your balance before you walk. Be aware of your surroundings. Common fall hazards that we see at the fire department are oxygen tubing, electrical cords, magazines or newspapers, bunched up rugs, or even pets. Be sure to look for possible hazards before you get started. Fall message number three, keep walking areas and stairs clear. Be sure to remove electrical cords, shoes, clothing, books and magazines, or any other clutter. Fall message number four, improve the lighting around your home. Use night lights to light a path between your bedroom and bathroom. Turn on the lights before using the stairs. See an eye specialist at least once a year. Poor vision can increase your chance of tripping and falling. Keep flashlights or battery operated lanterns close by. Fall message number five. Use non-slip mats in the bathtub. Use non-slip mats on shower floors. Use a bath seat. Have grab bars correctly installed on the wall in the tub and shower and next to the toilet. Keep the bathroom floor dry. Wipe up spills immediately. Fall message number six, be aware of uneven surfaces around your home. 
Throw rugs must have rubber, non-skid backing, smooth out wrinkles and folds in carpeting. Be aware of uneven sidewalks and pavement outdoors. Ask a friend to clear ice and snow from stairs and walkways. Use handrails whenever available. Fall message number seven. Stairways should be well lit. Stairways should be well lit from top to bottom. Both sides of the stairs should have easy to grip handrails along the stairs full length. And fall message number eight, wear sturdy, well-fitting shoes. Safety trumps fashion. Low-heeled shoes with non-slip soles are the best. These are much safer than high heels, thick-soled athletic shoes, or slippers. So what happens when you fall? So this is what happens when someone calls 911. Your 911 call will be answered by our local dispatch center, who will then dispatch the closest available fire engine and ambulance. Fire stations are strategically placed throughout the community in order to respond to your emergency in a timely manner. All fire department personnel are highly trained in emergency medical services, and each fire engine is required to have a minimum of one paramedic. Typically, a fire engine is first to arrive on scene where they render care and prepare the patient for transport to our local hospital. Here we have two individuals who have fallen. As EMS providers, we'd like to first identify the cause of the fall, such as was this a mechanical fall, meaning you tripped or lost your footing, or was this fall caused by a medical emergency, such as a cardiac problem that led the individual to faint and fall to the ground. If we are able to identify that this fall was caused by a medical emergency, we can then focus our efforts on treating the patient for a potentially more serious problem. If the fall was mechanical in nature, we can then treat the patient based on their chief complaint, meaning what is hurting that individual the most. Some of our biggest concerns involve instances where patients have fallen and hit their head, especially if the individual is currently on blood thinners, which could potentially lead to bleeding in and around the brain. Our other major concerns are injuries to the spine, more specifically the cervical spine. Injuries to the cervical spine have the potential to cause paralysis. With that being said, if you have fallen and are experiencing any pain to your head, neck, or back, please do not try and get up. Stay still and call for help. Medical alert devices. These devices save lives. If you have fallen recently or are at a risk of falling, please consider purchasing one of these devices. Once activated, the alarm company will contact our dispatch center directly, who will then have an engine and an ambulance dispatched within minutes to your emergency. Regardless of the cause of your fall, EMS personnel have the training and equipment to handle any of your emergencies. From spinal mobilization and pain management to cardiac monitoring, we are able to stabilize you and make you comfortable prior to transport. For more information on this presentation, type in Remembering When into your favorite search engine and the first listing that comes up is a link to our program. Thank you for tuning in today. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Stay safe. Thank you, Captain Dave. Now we're gonna see a demonstration of Tai Chi from Rachel and Beth. Tai Chi is known for increasing balance and flexibility, strength, and decreasing pain and falls. Beth and Rachel are both certified Tai Chi instructors for fall prevention. Hi everybody, I'm Beth Brio from NACOG Area Agency on Aging. And I'm Rachel Mills with Yavapai County Community Health Services. We want to talk to you about Tai Chi for fall prevention, for balance, for everyone. We often see Tai Chi demonstrated as a series of movements linked together with expert flow and ease. Well, it doesn't start out that way. Each movement is learned independently and then broken down into sections to make learning easy and enjoyable. Whatever your abilities, Tai Chi can suit your needs. The primary way Tai Chi improves balance and prevents falls is helping your body and mind to be aware of how your weight shifts all day from movement to movement. Each move you make shifts your body in many directions, even if you're seated in a chair. With slow, mindful movement, we increase the awareness of our steps and our surroundings, making our world safer and brighter.
we're going to run through a few of the Tai Chi moves now as an example of what a class may be like. So if you want to stay standing, you can. Or if you want to sit in a chair, um, just make sure that you have one that's good and, and steady. I'm going to have a chair just to my side for um, to use as balance. So let's start out first with our breathing, kind of bringing ourselves into focus and um, focusing on what we'll be doing next. So take just a minute, check what your posture is, maybe have your feet shoulder width apart. If you're standing, if you're sitting down, it would be nice to have a little bit of space in between your feet as well. And we'll just go ahead and take a few breaths, breathing in, filling up our abdomen, and then exhaling and letting out any tension or stress that we might be feeling. And again, taking another nice breath in, breathing in, and exhale, letting your breath come out. So we'll be encouraging you to breathe as we go through these exercises. And so let's go ahead and just start. We'll be doing um, two exercises, starting with our neck and then moving down to, to our feet. So with the first one, we're just going to breathe, breathe in, gently lifting up our chin. And then we'll bring our hands in towards us, gently tucking our chin in. And then bringing our hands back out, relaxing our neck. And then following our hands down as we lower them back down. So we'll go ahead and do that one more time. Again, bringing our hands up. Gently lifting up our head and bringing our, our hands in, gently tucking our chin in, bringing our hands back out, relaxing our neck, and then following our hands back down. All right, and then the next neck exercise, we're going to bring up both of our hands, gently lower one hand down about waist height. And then with our free hand, we'll have the palm in towards us and gently turning our head to the side. Just very small movements coming back to the front. And we'll alternate hands, switching over to the other side. So since we're just warming up, these are very mild, slow movements. Making sure that we're continuing to inhale and exhale. And we'll just switch over to our other hand. Breathing in and out. And we'll lower both of our hands down to our side. Now we're going to move down to our shoulder joints. So we're just going to gently make very small round movements. Just so you can feel the full range of motion without forcing. And then you're going to reverse it, going backwards with the same movements and keeping your mind on your breath. And relax your shoulders, feel the length in your neck. Turn your palms out. And go ahead and take an inhale in. It doesn't matter how high you lift your arms, whatever is comfortable for you. And as you exhale, draw your energy and your hands down. And one more time, inhale. And exhale. All right, now we'll move on to our spine. So we're just going to bring our arms out in front of us as if we're holding a ball. And then we'll bring our top hand down, bringing our bottom hand up. And now our, our top hand is gently turning so that our palm is facing outward, if that's a comfortable position. Then we'll go ahead and turn our palms so now they're coming together, back to that ball shape. And we're going to switch our hands and bring up our opposite arm. Again, continuing to inhale and exhale as we move our hands. Let's go ahead and do that one more time on each side, separating our hands, taking a nice breath in, and then we'll exhale, 
bringing our hands back together, switching over to the other side, and exhale, coming back to that ball shape. So now with our hand that's up on top, we're going to gently turn in the direction that our elbow is pointing. So let's go ahead and just very slightly turn to the side. Now we're moving our spine in a different axis. We'll switch our hands, rotating that ball. Our opposite hand is now on top. And so we'll come over to the other side, just gently turning and switching our hands. Being careful not to twist too far, we wanna stay kind of out in front of us, just moving right in front of our, our hip. Go ahead and switch your hands again. Continuing with those breaths, switching over to the other side. And we'll rotate the ball coming to the front and we'll just lower both of our hands back down. Next, we're gonna move down to our hips going into the lower body. So as we inhale, we're gonna just lift our hands up any, any amount of height that works best for you. And as we press our hands back, we move one heel forward. Just a tiny step. As we bring the hands forward, the toe, tiny step back. Once again, breathing, matching breath and movement. Here's the tricky part. We're gonna press our hands back and we're gonna shift our weight to the opposite side and to the opposite heel. Hands up, toe back. You begin to sense the flow that comes with time and Tai Chi practice. And rest your feet together. So our next hip exercise, you want to imagine that you're in a very small room where the walls are just to the outside of your shoulder. So I'm going to take my hands and I'm going to put my forearm against the one wall and my other hand rests just below the elbow. I'm just going to give gentle pressure against that wall and as I do, I'm going to step my opposite toe out to the side. I'm going to bring my foot in and I'm going to sweep my hands to the other side of the wall. Toe out. Taking your time. Not rushing through it or skipping any steps. Keeping your breath movement. And come back to center and lower your arms. All right, now we'll move on down to our, our knees. So you'll notice with these past couple of movements that we've done, we're shifting our weight more from side to side. If you're standing, it might be helpful just to rest your hand um, gently on the side of a, of a chair. And then even when you're sitting down, you can still kind of feel that weight shift from side to side. But so let's go ahead and get loose Tai Chi fists, we call them, and just bring them down by our, our waist. Again, we're gonna switch our weight over to one side, making sure that we're nice and strong on that stabilizing leg. Then with our opposite leg, we're just gonna bring it out lightly in front of us, bringing out our opposite arm. So we have some of that counterbalance and most of our weight is still on this back leg. So then we're coming back, again, shifting our weight to this other side, making sure that we're good and strong. And then we're stepping out gently with our free foot. And again, feel free to hold onto the chair if you're feeling a bit wobbly or even just until you feel more comfortable. And we'll continue to alternate from side to side. Keeping your weight nice and strong, making sure that you're stabilized before lifting up your foot. And hopefully we're still breathing. <laughs> All right, so with this next one, it's pretty similar to what we just did, only we have a little bit more of a weight transfer. So again, we have our loose fists just down by our sides. We're bringing our weight over to our nice strong leg, and then we're gonna place our heel down, then the ball of our foot, 
and now we're gently bringing our weight forward. So now we're about 70% on this front leg. We still have some weight on this back leg. Then we'll bring our weight back, switching over to the other side, placing our heel down, then the ball of our foot, and we're bringing our weight forward. So even though I'm seated, you can clearly see that my weight is rocking from side to side as I move. Just a, another note to be mindful of, as we're placing our foot out in front and then transferring our weight, we still want to have an upright posture. So we don't necessarily want to lean too far forward, um, just making sure that we're slowly shifting our weight forward and then coming back. And finally, moving down to our ankles. So I'm just going to extend one heel, switch to the toe, and just rock back and forth moving our ankles along with our breath and come back to center and weight shifts to the other side. Heel, heel, toe, heel, toe. And a different type of movement is I'm going to turn the sole of my foot in towards the center of my body. Out, in, out, in, out and come on back and even if it does you can't make a big movement with your ankle you can just gently begin to ease into it and come on back well, we've showed you a variety of ways that you can practice Tai Chi using a chair for balance seated in the chair or standing independently and Tai Chi not only improves balance, it increases our muscle strength, flexibility, and it promotes deeper breathing for better circulation and relaxation. And it's a lot of fun. To join a group, contact your local area agency on aging or your local health department. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Rachel and Beth. Now we're going to hear from Katana Brown, PhD, a professor of occupational therapy at Midwestern University and Froma Jackson, occupational therapist for more than 50 years, also at Midwestern University. They're going to be showing us concepts of car fit and bike fit and assisted devices for transportation safety. Hello, I'm Tana Brown. I'm faculty at Midwestern University. And my name is Froma Jacobson, and I am also faculty at Midwestern University. Tana and I became very interested in the connection between car fit and bike fit a couple years ago. And just for introductory purposes, CarFit is a collaborative effort between the American Occupational Therapy Association, AAA and ARP to look at the senior driver defined as the driver 55 plus and how their car fits them. So CarFit does not look at someone's ability to drive. Instead, CarFit looks at how well the car fits the person in terms of the height of the seat, the seat belt, if the airbag would deploy, this kind of situation. And the relationship between car fit and bike fit in, in occupational therapy is quite special because occupational therapy looks at all those important activities in which we engage. And we know that driving is a, a life marker. When somebody turns 15 and a half or 16, depending on the state, the ability to drive is a milestone and something very exciting. But conversely, towards the last chapters of life, people become very fearful of losing their ability to drive because it allows us our independence. Now, I've blown out a lot of birthday candles and I tease and I say that I'm 69 plus more because I don't quite want to admit how old I am, but I'm a car buff and I love to drive and driving is really important to me. So that's a picture of my little red Volvo. I get a new car every few months because I want to have the newest and the best and the most fun. And it's important for me 
as a single adult living alone to be able to run to the grocery store and go to the dry cleaners and go to the pharmacy and go out to eat and go hiking and go to the beach and go to a grandson's soccer game or a granddaughter's ballet concerts. And I don't wanna to have to call Lyft. I don't wanna to have to call Uber. So it scares me at this stage of my life that there may be a point at which I'm not able to drive. And I had an embarrassing story, actually a couple stories that, that I will share with you, but you cannot repeat them. You'll have to promise. I was meeting my children for dinner one night and we were going to some sort of dark light miniature golf or something and going out for Chinese food. And I got there early and there was a car wash and it was like, whoa, I can go get my car washed and really show off my spiffy red sports car. So I drove in to the automatic car wash and coming out, I felt myself curbing the left back wheel of my car. And I was afraid to get out of the car wash and I was afraid to look at my car. And sure enough, I'd taken a chunk out of the rubber and I'd scraped up the wheels and I was humiliated. I was embarrassed for myself. I was angry at myself. And I was really embarrassed if my children looked at the car and went, mom, what happened to this car? So I tried to put it aside and I tried to go through the evening. And then the next week I was getting a haircut. Same kind of situation, same place on my car, the left back wheel. And I pulled myself over and I slowed myself down and calmed myself down. And it's like, Froma, what did you just do? What is going on with you? Do you need to be the one to decide that it's time to retire from driving? So after a few deep breaths, I looked around the car and I had this big aha go off. I had gotten my car service. They had done a detailing at the dealership and they had adjusted my car for the person, the lot attendant who was driving my car. I couldn't even see over the, the front of the car. I couldn't see over the hood. My seat was too low. My mirrors were not right. My seat was not comfortable. I was having trouble reaching the gas pedal and the brake pedal. And this is what had caused me to have those incidents in the same place of my car. And I looked myself in the mirror and I went, Froma, you should have known better. You know that anytime your body changes or someone else has driven your car, you need to readjust the car to fit your body. And that is what car fit is all about. So in car fit, you are going to be sent to at your leisure, the carfit.org website. And you are able to go onto this site and you are able to get an explanation of CarFit, see CarFits in your area and actually register for a CarFit event. And the important thing that you need to remember about CarFit is no one is looking at your ability to drive. All they are do, doing is looking at, again, how your car fits your body as your body currently is. And I don't think we realize as senior adults that on a bad neck day, it's hard to turn your neck to see the cars passing on one side or the other. Or if you've just come from yoga or massage, you may feel so relaxed. So the reminder is your body is going to change throughout the day, throughout the week, and certainly over a six week period, you need to adjust those simple things on your car to fit your body as your body is to be able to be a safe driver and enjoy happy motoring. This is the car fit checklist. And I know it's probably very hard to see, but you're gonna be able to blow up a copy when you go to the website. But the first thing it asks is if you're wearing a seatbelt and are you wearing a seatbelt properly? And do you know that you can adjust the origin of the seatbelt to be the proper height. We also look at the steering wheel tilt. We wanna make certain that if the airbags deploy, they will not deploy to your neck or to your face and cause you an, an injury. There's also a concern for the distance between your chest and the airbag. As I get shorter, I have to sometimes sit up taller to look over the steering wheel. So we wanna make sure that the driver's eyes are three inches above the steering wheel. So we're looking at the head restraint, we're looking at access to the gas pedals, we're looking at mirrors, neck mobility in the blind spot, how mirrors work together. If a person knows how to operate their, their vehicle and the um, 
rain sensors, for instance, on that column. So looking at all of these different things, and then there's a final checkout very often with an occupational therapist going over and educating the driver and possibly anyone who has come with the driver for a car fit for things that can be done to help them be safer drivers in their current vehicles. These are some of the items that are available on Amazon or in a local store. One is a leg lifter. I use this when I had hurt my knee and I couldn't get my injured leg into the car. This was a way to lift my leg in. Key holders, some people have automatic keys or the key that just sits the fob inside your purse or your pocket so you don't need it. But for people whose motor dexterity cannot handle the key holder, a way to open the gas can, gas cap if you do not have the fine motor coordination. Probably the most exciting to me on this slide is the swivel seat. It's sort of like a lazy Susan to help somebody get in the car. Carfit can help you look at these things and make a purchasing decision before you actually make the investment. So I'm gonna let Tana talk to you about how BikeFit became an addendum to Carfit and how Midwestern University and our students have made this contribution and add on. So in addition to being an occupational therapist, I'm also an avid cyclist and I happen to be the president of Bike Prescott. And a few years ago, we had several incidents where people were riding their bikes in Prescott and were hit by cars. So we brought together a number of people, cyclists and um, the bike pedestrian committee for the city, some owners um, of the bike shops, and talked about um, what were the most important things that both cyclists and drivers could do to make that fit better between both of us sharing the road. So we came up with this idea that we would create bike fit and like car fit, um, someone would talk to cyclists and make recommendations for how they could ride their bikes more safely. So one of the points that we make in Bike Fit is the importance of wearing a helmet. And um, any helmet is going to be better than no helmet but recently they've come out with a new system, um, a multi-directional impact protection system. Most people just refer to it as MIPS. And if you're looking to buy a bike helmet, you might wanna look for this because uh, the MIPS system is more helpful in terms of if you hit your head and protecting um, against concussions. Another point that we're going to be making in Bike Fit is the importance of being seen. And there's a number of things that cyclists um, can do so that others will see them more easily. Um, they can have lights on their bicycles. And most of us that ride in Prescott now have a blinky light that we put in on the back of our bike that's very visible to motorists. Some of us also have a white blinking light that they put in the front of their bike. Um, cyclists can also have mirrors either on their helmets or on their handlebars so that they can see approaching cars. And then finally, wearing um, bright colored clothing helps motorists see cyclists. And here you can see us in our specific bike Prescott jerseys. Another important facet of bike fit is knowing the rules of the road and the idea that both cyclists and drivers can share the road safely. So one thing that's important is knowing that motorists are expected to give bicyclists three feet of space when passing, um, that we need to take extra care at intersections when we were doing our research into um, bike fit, one of the things we learned both locally and at a national level is 
that the most um, common place that accidents happen is at intersections. Uh, so both the cyclist and the motorist needs to be more careful when they're entering that intersection to make sure they're crossing carefully. And then um, this uh, picture here illustrates a sharo, and many of, of you may not know what this means, but in cases where there's no shoulder or a bike lane doesn't exist, some um, cities have created this designation, which means that the cyclist can take the full road. And in Prescott, we have a few roads in downtown that have these um, sharrows. For um, Bike Fit, we created a special pamphlet that we can make available to you that talks about knowing the rules of the road. So I've gone through the most important things that we talked about with cyclists, wearing a helmet, being visible, watching for turning cars at intersections and using road and bike lanes appropriately. And I know that um, sometimes drivers become frustrated with cyclists when they're not riding where they, where they should be. So we're working to get the word out to cyclists to be more careful. And then for drivers, um, we'd like to caution them to be patient when passing a cyclist and when they do so to give the cyclist three feet of space, um, to be careful when turning and looking for cyclists that might be going straight in an intersection. Um, when you're parked um, parallel be careful when opening the driver's side door because a cyclist could be coming behind us and it's a really um, horrible accident when a cyclist runs into that open door. So be careful to look behind you when opening your door. And then we also ask that you don't honk at cyclists. We can usually tell when it's a friendly or when it's an angry honk, but sometimes um, even the friendly honks are a little bit startling and it could cause the cyclist to swerve into traffic. So it's better not to honk. This is just the other side of that pamphlet. So I've given you my information for scheduling a car fit by fit share the road. Right now, because of COVID, we all know that things are slowing down a little bit and we are not able to schedule an actual face-to-face -face car fit until at least October, but certainly invite you to give me a call or send me an email or a text for current information. When you do go to carfit.org, you will see that you're able to do a virtual car fit class and you're able to do a virtual car fit checkup or that 11 point inspection. Typically face-to-face -face, a, car, a car fit takes 20 minutes to 30 minutes, but you certainly are able to do this in your community to start to assess the changes that you need to make in your car. Thank you so much for your time, your attention and your interest. And we look forward to happy motoring and happy biking and safely sharing the road with each and every one of you. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Finally, we're gonna hear from Andrew Stickel. He is a Prescott-based physical therapist. He's experienced in home health and outpatient-based therapy. He's gonna give you a demonstration on what to do if you do have a fall, and uh, it's very fascinating information. So Andrew, you're next. Hello, and thank you for joining us here today for this uh, falls tutorial and informative um, presentation. I'd like to just briefly thank the Northern Chapter of the Arizona Falls Prevention Coalition for inviting me to speak today. Uh, this is a very important topic and it does reach uh, many, many of our seniors here in the uh, county and surrounding areas. So uh, a brief bit about falls. Um, the first and most important thing I like to tell folks about falls is that it is definitely not a 
natural or assumed part of the aging process. Um, falls have a multitude of factors that play into any uh, specific fall or any circumstance surrounding a fall. And I'll briefly touch on a couple of those that are a little bit outside of my scope of knowledge and then bring it into uh, the main areas that are directly in my scope of knowledge. Um, the first is medications. So it's very important that you have an open line of communication with your doctors regarding the number of medications that you're on, what they are for, how long you need to be on them, and then revisit that at every appointment. Anytime you have a medication change, um, you can have a risk of an interaction to the medications that you're already taking that could lead to dizzy spells or some other factor that may lead you to have a loss of balance that could lead to a fall. Um, if you are on three or more medications, that is an increased fall risk. So three or more, and a lot of us are on three or more medications. I have patients that come in often that bring me a list of 15 or 20 medications that they're on. So if you're on upwards of 15 or 20 medications or anything over than three, the, the number of possible interactions of those medications is, becomes exponential. So you just need to have an open line of communication with the physician and make sure that um, those things are being tracked. If you've started a new medication, don't disregard any, any new change in your body or any, any other symptom and, and disregard it. Make sure to report it to your doctor. The other, th the other piece is nutrition. I mean, nutrition is a very important uh, component and yet sim pretty simple component of uh, helping to prevent falls. And the biggest piece of that, in my experience, is hydration. So we're all uh, chronically dehydrated, generally speaking, especially living in the desert and living in the high mountain desert that we call home here. We need to be drinking a lot of water. And what is a lot of water? How, are we drinking enough water? What does that look like? Well, we should be getting about 64 ounces or more of fluid in a day. So that's eight, eight ounce glasses. Um, if we're not a water people, that can look like milk or juice or something like that. But it, it shouldn't look like eight cups of caffeinated coffee or other caffeinated beverage because caffeine has a diuretic effect that will also dehydrate you. So. It's okay to have that cup of coffee in the morning, but make sure that the rest of the fluid throughout the day is uh, water or some other uh, something like that, okay? Now, staying hydrated helps our muscles um, work at an optimal level, helps our um, nervous system respond as quickly as it can. So if we do need to catch our balance or we do need to change of direction to accommodate for an um, an outside uh, tripping on uh, an uneven surface or catching your toe on a rug or something like that, then we can do that just a little bit faster uh, if our muscles are nice and hydrated. The other thing that hydration helps is uh, maintaining a consistent blood pressure. So if we become dehydrated, our blood volume becomes decreased or can become decreased and that lowers our blood pressure. So oftentimes if we are um, going from sitting to standing or changing position, going from laying down to sitting up, getting up from a nap, getting up from bed, and we stand up quickly, we can get a little lightheaded, a little dizzy, and if our blood pressure is already low and it drops even lower, that, can that could be a, a significant fall risk factor that really can be uh, addressed simply by making sure that we're staying adequately hydrated. So that's another simple thing that we can do to uh, uh, help in the vein of fall prevention, okay? Um, so moving into briefly some of the areas that are more in my wheelhouse as a physical therapist is balance and strength, okay? Now, there are many medical factors that can play into uh, balance and strength, but 
To put it simply, at any age, at any medical condition, we can improve our balance and we can improve our strength if we are practicing and working on those things. It doesn't have to be getting to a gym three or four times a week for an hour. It can be very simple things, and I think we'll address some of these and uh, things that we can do in the questions uh, later on here. But uh, it's very important um, to remember the old adage, if you don't use it, you lose it. Okay, uh, Balance is, is very much that way. As we get older, our mobility starts to decrease. Uh, and we start to move in one plane, okay? We walk forward, maybe we turn and we walk forward, or we sometimes walk backwards. But we're not moving in a lot of different planes that we do when, when we're younger or when we're more active, okay? So we have to practice those, those movement patterns in order to maintain that level of balance. And your balance is made up of th primarily three systems. Um, the vestibular system is an important one, and that is your inner ear canal and your equ general equilibrium, and um, that also needs to be, that's also a system that can be worked on and can be practiced uh, um, through different exercises. The other, other piece of that is the, the visual system. Now, our vision sometimes as we age, starts to go, and we can't. Uh, sometimes we don't have a lot of say over that, so we have to make sure that if we are relying heavily on our vision to uh, provide input for our balance, that we make sure that our other systems are running at optimal level uh, if we start to lose our vision. <clears throat> the third is the proprioception. So, proprioception is your body's sensory system that allows you to sort of determine without looking where your limbs are in space. So for example, I know without looking at my arm that it is fully extended and reaching out. I don't have to look at that because there's different sensors in my muscles and my joints and my tendons that provide feedback to my brain and tell me where I am in space. So that is something that we can work on too with exercise. Point, the main point is all of these systems can be developed wherever they're at, whatever level they're at, they can be improved with practice, okay? That's not to say that if we're 70 or 80 years old, we're gonna be able to get the balance that we had when we were 20, but that's to say that whatever age we're at, whatever medical condition, it is very worthwhile to practice those things because they can be improved. Strength is the same, uh, the same thing. So a multitude of conditions may prevent us from uh, doing a real aggressive strengthening program such as arthritis or, or other things like that. But at, at any age with any medical condition, you can have an adapted strengthening program that will allow you to improve your strength from where it is at this point. And those two things are vital in maintaining mobility and helping to reduce the risk of falls. Um, brings, bringing to the next uh, point, a little visual demonstration for you. Um, the first part of that is mostly fall prevention. However, falls do happen and they happen quite frequently. So if we are finding ourselves in a situation where we did have a fall, um, this is the question that I get almost every class is how do I get up? What's a good way to get up from the floor if I did have a fall? Um, so I'd like to demonstrate that today. Uh, the first thing I always say though is to make sure that um, you try your best to prevent yourself from finding yourself on the floor in the first place. But the, the next best thing is to make sure that you don't have someone try to help you. I think that's important if we're living at home uh, with a spouse or loved one that we make sure that uh, we don't recruit extra help uh, because we may find that extra help on the floor with us or we may hurt ourselves further in the process. Uh, what I like to suggest to people is that you call the paramedics if you do have a fall and you're at, and you're at home and you can get yourself near a phone or you have a phone on you or a call button, 
you can just call, make it simple. Uh, the fire department, uh, they have trained staff, they're good at their job and they can come out and they can also provide an assessment if there's an injury that maybe you didn't realize. A lot of times when we have a fall, there's a lot of adrenaline and if you do have a broken hip or some other broken bone or some other significant injury, you may not realize that right away. And trying to get up without realizing that may cause you more uh, more of a significant injury than you otherwise may have sustained. So that's uh, another take home. If you can, avoid falling in the first place. Secondly, call the paramedics if you're able to reach the phone or you, or you are able to do that. Lastly, getting up or trying to get up from the floor. So um, this is of course, a demonstration with a nice chair here, and I'm in an optimal environment, so I know the falls can happen anytime, any place. We don't always have that, but this is just one example. So, um, if I do have a fall and I can get near a chair or there's a chair in the area, that is really a great way to try to, or a piece of furniture that looks similar to a chair, it could be a couch or a bed. Uh, this, is, this is one technique that you could do, okay? So, I'll grab this, oh, thanks. Appreciate it. Okay, so back to the fall. So I'm here, I've, I've had a fall briefly. Everybody falls nice and slow like this, right? So I'm down here, if I'm on my back or I'm on my side, the first thing I try to recommend to people to do is just take a minute. Because like I said, if you have a fall, and if you've had a fall, you understand this, you have a lot of adrenaline. Some people have a hard time even remembering the circumstances surrounding the fall because it happens so quickly. And then there's an adrenaline rush and that helps, that kind of mitigates some of our memories of certain situations as well. So try to, try to take, give yourself a minute, check yourself, Make sure you know you're not bleeding from any place. You you don't have any injuries that are screaming out at you. Finding a chair, if I have one here, great. If I have a bed here, great. Couch, something like that. I might have to get on, try to get onto my side. Okay, if I can get onto my side like this, get into position where I might need to move across a room, or I might need to move someplace to get to something like this. And if you can do that then try to do it. If you can get on your hands and knees and crawl, that's fine. Some of us with knee arthritis or maybe knee replacements, that's not gonna work so well. So if you can scoot on your hip and disperse some of the weight through your hip and your knee and your lower leg, that, that works pretty well, and your elbow also. So you're getting to this spot here, sliding over, trying to get up here if I can, taking a break, okay? That's the other piece. Try to take a break each spot along the way. This is very taxing, this is very fatiguing, and you're gonna need a lot of energy to get from one phase to the next. So it's very important that you rest along the way, okay? So if I'm here, I'm gonna take a rest, catch my breath, again, maybe check and make sure I don't have any injuries that I overlooked the first time. And I'm up here. And now if I can get to my knees, that is the best position. Maybe I do it like this, okay, here, and I can get here. Now that might be tough for some of us with the knee replacements, but you try to stay back, not, on, not forward on your knees, but a little farther back so you're not, you're not kneeling on that kneecap, on that patella. That will be a little bit easier. Here, as soon as I'm here, then I can kind of lean forward and take some of the weight off my legs, my hips, my knees. And again, I'm gonna rest here. I'm just gonna rest. I'm gonna catch my breath. However long that may take. If, if you're having a lot of discomfort in the knees, you may not rest here that long and that's okay. But if you can tolerate it, you can rest here as long as you need to, to make the next push. And that's gonna be up onto the elbows. If you don't have arm rest here, then you can maybe, you could do something like this and try to get your leg up like that, okay? This right here is pretty tough. Flexibility wise, hip wise, in the hip and knee, this is a hard movement to make, but um, you can try this, okay? And then up here, br bring the other leg up. Again, moving slowly, maybe I rest here for a minute. And then, when I'm ready, up to the top, 
maybe maintaining contact with the chair throughout the whole movement just in case, like I said earlier, if you get a little lightheaded going from, from the floor position, moving up through the sequence into the standing position. So this, move slow, rest, and um, that's one example of, of a way to get up from the floor, okay? Okay, so now we'd like to take a few questions that have been emailed in um, and posted and we'd like to answer those. So I'll ask Beth to read them out and then I will do my best to answer them. First things first. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, someone I know fell recently. Is that a sign of aging? So I think the important uh, answer to that question is that... Uh, Frequent falls or falling is not or should not be an expected part of the aging process. There are certainly things that occur, medical conditions that worsen. You know, we get weaker, we get our balance decreases uh, because we're not practicing it. And that can play into uh, the fall risk. But if you're having falls, that should not be just accepted as part of aging. I think that's an important uh, thing to remember. So if, talk to the doctor, talk to your physical therapist to, to try to get to the bottom of why you're having those falls. So what kinds of things can cause a fall? Like I said earlier, there's a, uh, there's a broad spectrum of factors that can play into uh, falls. In my experience, your home environment, um, your medical condition, which would include uh, medications and the number of medications you're taking, uh, your physical condition, which would be strengthening, uh, balance, um, all those things can play into and, and be factors in the, in the fall. And those things are all things that can be addressed. So, Are there exercises that can help prevent falling? So this is a great question, and I often, as a physical therapist, I often get people to ask me, what's the best thing I can do for blank, fill in the blank? And my answer to that is usually, or always, is, well, what will you do? Because I can tell you what the best exercise is for something, but if you don't do it, it's not very helpful, okay? So the best exercise for falls, in my opinion is something that you can do consistently. So maybe it's walking with some friends. Maybe it's uh, setting up a walking group or program. Maybe it's chair yoga. Maybe it's chair exercises. Whatever you're going to do consistently that puts an emphasis on strength, flexibility, and balance, I think is the best exercise that you can do for falls and fall prevention. Will limiting my activities prevent me from falling? That's kind of a that's kind of a twofold uh, or double-edged question, and I think it's a very good question because quite often what we see when somebody's had a few falls is that they become fearful of falling, so their their activity goes down and decreases just almost as a as a defense mechanism. And in a vacuum, sure, if you never get out of the chair you probably won't ever fall, but that's not how, that's not how we live. We, we live, you know, we have to get up, we eventually have to get up and do things. So by limiting your activities, you're actually making it a little bit worse, I believe, because when you do get up, which you will ultimately have to, you now are weaker and you're not, your balance is that much more atrophied. And so I think it's important to, if you had some falls and you're thinking that, I just want to limit my activity, talk to a medical provider. They can get you doing some things in a safe environment, in a safe capacity that you feel comfortable with that will challenge those systems so that you don't have further atrophy. I heard that if I fall, I could end up in a nursing home. Is that true? If, if so, how can I prevent it? So... If you have a fall and you have a significant injury, I think you know it's a possibility that you would have to end up in a rehab center of sorts, which oftentimes are in nursing homes. But I don't think it's a, I, I no, I, I don't think it's a it's a linear line from or a linear process from one fall to the nursing home. No, 
But there is studies to support that the number, one of the biggest uh, ADL categories uh, or factors that play into somebody's need for increased level of care, meaning like if you're in assisted living needing nursing home level, or if you're at home by yourself needing more assisted living level of care, is uh, from an ADL standpoint is the ability to get off of the toilet. So that's just a, a very basic um, lower extremity activity, of course, but it's a gross measurement of your lower extremity strength. So. Is there a test that the doctor can order for me to see if I'm likely to fall? Um, there's certainly a lot of uh, diagnostic imaging that the physician could order depending on what he or she is seeing as the problem or, or trying to figure out as the problem, maybe the cause of the fall. But from, a, from a, a very simple test that I do in the clinic and in the home is called the 30 second chair stand test. And this is something that you could do at home as well. Uh, and so just to briefly demonstrate this, uh, and this is one that I like to use too because it gives us a, a pre test and then once we've worked on some exercises and worked for a little while with physical therapy it gives us uh, an opportunity to do a post test as well so sitting in a regular chair um, you can use your hands or not the the pure test is not using your hands so 12 reps not using your hands, sometimes using your hands on your lap is all right, but not using your hands from here. Some people are unable, unable to do that, and that's all right. So if you have to, if you have to use your hands just to, to uh, achieve one rep, then go ahead and time it using your hands. And then when you do the retest, you just make sure you can use your hands as well so that you're doing the same thing using the same chair. So going from sitting to standing in 30 seconds, you can have a timer or your phone, and you just go up all the way up and all the way down. All the way up, make sure you get your balance, and all the way down, and then go as fast as you can, okay? As fast as you can comfortably and safely is the, is the key. And all the way down, don't do this, okay? You wanna come all the way down to a rested position and all the way up to a fully extended position, okay? Just like that, 30 seconds is up. How many did you get? Excellent. So you're trying to get 12. That is the that is the number. That's just generally it's different for age groups, but generally speaking, I think 12 is a good number to get. So once again, I'd like to uh, thank the Northern Chapter of uh, the AZ Falls Prevention Coalition for having me speak uh, and have giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. And I'm Andrew Stickle from uh, Backways Physical Therapy in, in Prescott, Arizona. And take care and keep moving. Thank you, Andrew, for that wonderful information. And thank you all for participating today and to all of our professionals who gave us information to help us out on our daily living. Now Beth and Rachel are gonna come back with concluding remarks. Thank you to everybody who helped make this event possible. We hope you enjoyed all these presentations. If you would like more information on preventing falls, your community is your best resource. Reach out to the local health departments, area agency on aging, medical professionals, or fire departments for what's available in your area. Thank you and stay safe.